Following the reintroduction of 15 wolves into the central Idaho wilderness in 1995, an additional 20 wolves were transplanted into Idaho from Canada. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service wanted to make sure they brought enough adult wolves into central Idaho so they could pair up, set up territories, and produce young on their own, restoring wolves to the central Idaho ecosystem. The experiment worked extremely well. The central Idaho wolf population took off rapidly, just as transplanted wolves did in Yellowstone National Park. The central Idaho wolf population grew quickly to the official recovery goal for Idaho, 10 breeding pairs, or roughly 100 plus wolves, in just three years. There was a record high elk population in the Frank Church River of No Return wilderness at the time, an estimated 6,000 animals. So the wolves had plenty to eat. Well, I didn't expect them to take off quite like they did. I figured that they would expand um, and do quite nicely because they, they had a food source and uh, so they would do well. Wolf advocates were overjoyed with having wolves setting up residence in central Idaho. They went camping in the Frank, hoping to hear wolves howl in the woods at night. I geek out on, over wildlife and I love large predators and my wife and I have traveled far and wide to see large predators. We've gone to Brazil to see jaguars, we've gone to Africa to see the big predators there and so when we moved to Idaho, you know, the chance to actually be, have large predators in our backyard was part of the thrill. Matt and his wife went camping in Bear Valley, hoping they would hear wolves. There were Chinook salmon literally splashing in the stream by our campground. There were elk bugling up in the hills, and I thought, what could make this better? And we climb into our sleeping bags that night, and all of a sudden, my wife said, is that a siren? And we had grown up around coyotes. I'm like, it's not a coyote. And then, whoa, it's wolves. And just for the next 45 minutes, there was this deep howling echoing across the canyon. And for me, um, just being out there with those large predators, it makes the wild a bit more wild. But it wouldn't take long for wolves to prey on livestock. Just nine days after the first batch of wolves were transplanted into central Idaho in January of 1995, Wolf B-13 ventured 60 air miles to salmon rancher Gene Hussey's cattle pasture and was found dead from a gunshot wound, lying next to a dead calf that B-13 had presumably killed. Hussey notified the county sheriff and wildlife services immediately. A necropsy was performed in the field by a wildlife services agent. Dead calf. I spent one into the night skinning the calf. Everybody watching me, making my determination. It, the calf had walked. It was alive, had been a live calf. It was my determination that the wolf killed the calf. The wolf kill confirmed what ranchers had feared all along that wolves would not necessarily stay in the Frank Church or Selway Bitterroot wilderness boundaries, and they would kill livestock on private ranch lands outside of the wilderness. This was the first of many incidents of wolves killing livestock to come. It, the citizens of Sam and Chalice were on edge. The classic clash between the federal government, state, and local government yeah. was happening right there in the wild west of Idaho. When it came to managing wolves in Idaho, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service had to contract with the Nez Perce tribe to do the field work and monitoring. The Idaho legislature prohibited the Idaho Department of Fish and Game from assisting with wolf reintroduction in any way. Knowing the political realities, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service had bypassed the state of Idaho with the wolf reintroduction program by releasing the animals on national forest lands controlled by the federal government. They didn't need state permission, but if they had asked for it, they wouldn't have gotten it. Idaho legislators didn't take kindly to being forced to do anything by the federal government, especially something so controversial. They were obviously very much opposed to it. They, it just seemed somewhat insane. It, it just it didn't make sense that you would bring something like a wolf uh, back into uh, 
uh, the, the environment when you had worked so long for so many years over so many generations to eliminate that pain and suffering for your livestock. And so suddenly here you're in a situation where you're confronted with wolves who are viewed as something which rips and tears and kills uh, your sheep and your livestock and you're prevented from protecting them as you would like to do. The gulf between urban environmentalists who wanted wolves in Idaho versus rural ranchers, some of them state legislators who opposed wolves, was as wide as the Grand Canyon. Big game hunters had mixed opinions. Some feared that wolves would decimate elk and bighorn sheep herds. It was uh, probably the most controversial wildlife issue I was ever involved with. Uh, and, and, and the emotion on both sides of the, the spectrum, uh, from those that, that uh, said they were going to eat all the children to the ones that, that said, uh, no, there's never been a problem and there, there won't be any problems. So, it, um, yeah, it was just extremely tense. You really try to, to draw a good hand in life and make everything work but it's much better off that you learn to play a bad hand well. And that's what Idaho had to do with wolf introduction under the Endangered Species Act. By this time, it became clear to Senator Ney that state of Idaho needed to develop a wolf management plan that would be acceptable to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service so wolves could be delisted from the Endangered Species Act and the state could manage wolves on its own. Meanwhile, wolf populations continued to thrive in central Idaho. By the end of 2003, there were 38 wolf packs producing litters in central Idaho and 375 plus wolves, more than three times as many breeding pairs as needed to delist wolves in Idaho, according to the Nez Perce Tribe Wolf Monitoring Report. In 2002, the Idaho legislature adopted a wolf management plan for Idaho. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service accepted the plan. The legislature was ready for Idaho Fish and Game to take over wolf management in Idaho. For wolves to be delisted from the Endangered Species Act, one more benchmark had to be achieved. Montana and Wyoming also had to create a wolf management plan that was acceptable to the Fish and Wildlife Service. The state of Wyoming was slow in getting that done. By 2006, there were at least 673 wolves in Idaho and 76 wolf packs, according to an annual monitoring report by Idaho Fish and Game and the Nez Perce Tribe. The same year, wolves killed 40 cattle, 237 sheep, and four dogs in 117 different investigations on wolf depredation. In January 2007, the Fish and Wildlife Service published a rule in the Federal Register that delisted wolves from the Endangered Species Act in Idaho and Montana. Both states had met and exceeded all the legal requirements. In response, a coalition of 13 environmental and animal rights groups sued the Secretary of Interior, contending that it wasn't appropriate to delist wolves in only Idaho and Montana. Idaho Fish and Game held its first wolf hunting season in 2009. More than 29,000 wolf tags were sold, leading to a harvest of about 135 wolves. The wolf hunting season stopped the steady increase in wolf population for the first time since wolf reintroduction began. In 2010, a federal judge from Montana blocked delisting and halted state management. No hunting or trapping would be allowed. But finally, in 2011, Congressman Mike Simpson of Idaho and Senator John Tester of Montana attached a rider to an appropriations bill, delisting wolves from the Endangered Species Act in Montana and Idaho. The congressional maneuver was upheld in federal court. Hunting and trapping seasons resumed in the fall of 2011 in Idaho. With state management in place now, Idaho Fish and Game could manage wolves as a big game animal with hunting and trapping seasons on an ongoing basis. It had taken 16 years to get wolves removed from the endangered species list. Wolf advocates had succeeded in restoring wolves to central Idaho in numbers 
far greater than the 10 breeding pair that the reintroduction plan envisioned. That was the camel's nose. And uh, there's no way uh, they could have possibly actually believed, Babbitt could have possibly believed that he could introduce the wolves into one little part of the Rocky Mountain West and that that's where they were gonna stay. And so they're gonna to have to go out and establish new territory and they knew that. What really happens? What's the unintended consequences? And the unintended consequences was the fact that after the introduction, even with all the denials, the population of wolves exploded and uh, they, the, the federal government had management of them and they weren't gonna turn it over to the states.